<laughs> was that to yourself or? No, that was, I was gonna. I was gonna describe your book. Are we live? I think we're. Yeah, no, we're live. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to Shop Talk: Marginalized Creators on Craft. My name is Aaron H. Estevis, and my pronouns are he/him. I'm the author of "This Is Why They Hate Us," a young adult novel coming spring 2022 from Simon and Schuster Books for Young Readers. "This Is Why They Hate Us" is a story of 17-year-old Enrique Luna, who tries to use the summer after his junior year to get over his feelings for his best friend Salim. I'm your moderator tonight, and I'm talking with mortal enemies, Emery Lee and Johnny Garcevia. Emery Lee, E-R-M, is a kidlit author, artist, and YouTuber hailing from a mixed racial background. After graduating with a degree in creative writing, E's gone on to author novels, short stories, and web comics. When away from reading and writing, you'll most likely find him engaged in art or snuggling cute dogs. Our debut novel, Meet Cute Diary, releases May 4th, 2021, from Quill Tree Books slash HarperCollins. Thank you for joining us, Emery. Thank you for um, giving me this platform to publicly attack Johnny. You are very welcome. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is our second panel together, right? Yeah. Yeah, we did the Latinx Kidlit Book Festival, which is fun. Um, but it feels like more. I love that it's like we're still neither of us have actually debuted yet and we've already done two panels together like this is promising <laughs> that is true um our other guest <laughs> as you may already know, other. Our, our other guest <laughs> um is johnny garcevia johnny they them is a product of the great state of texas born and raised near and along the gulf coast <laughs> currently living on unceded jumanos and tonkawa land they are an author of contemporary young adult literature inspired by their own Tejane, Ichikane, and queer identities. Whether writing about coming out for the first time, first love, immigration, or mariachi, Johnny hopes to tell stories where young Chicanes might feel seen and at home. 1500 Miles from the Sun is their debut novel and will be out June 8th, 2020, 2021. Yes, this year, uh, <laughs> which is during Pride Month, which is really exciting. It is. Um, thank you for joining us, Johnny. Thank you for summoning me. <laughs> I just put a Red Bull on like a, a Whataburger and you just appeared. <laughs> Johnny, we've also been on a panel together long, long ago. We have. Um, organized. Organization that shall not be named. Yes, I, I literally have that. <laughs> I'm like organized by a group that we shall not name. I was like, what did I say? Oh, never mind. Never mind. And Emery, Emery, you were supposed to be a part of that too. You know, you know, things happen. Thing, you got out, you got out quick. It was smart. Um, anyway, okay. So uh, introductions are done. Uh, I would like to hear from you guys uh, more in-depth synopses of your books. So Johnny, you were scrambling to figure it out before we went live. Uh, so I think you should go first. Cool. Um, so 1500 Miles from the Sun is my debut young adult novel. It centers Julian, AKA Jules Luna, who is a Corpus Christi, Texas high school senior, um, who's just trying to have like a really low key senior year before going off to college. Um, but then kind of just like shits on those plans whenever he gets um, just heinously drunk and accidentally comes out as gay on Twitter. And in the days and weeks and months that follow, Jules will find out all of the joy and love and acceptance that can come whenever you live out your most honest truth, but also the rejection and hate that comes whenever um, you, you do that. Yeah. And, that, and that's the official pitch. It's on the book. It says shits on all of that. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Great. And Emery? Um, so Meet Your Diary is a rom-com about a little shithead named Noah, who is a trans boy who runs a romance blog, but when the blog is exposed as fake by a troll, he ends up staging a fake relationship with one of the blog's fans who is on the, also on the cover because they're cute and stuff, it's cute everywhere. They are. Um, and so he has to stage the perfect romance to prove that trans people can in fact have a dream romance. The problem is that he is the biggest like 
full of life and he thinks that he knows everything about romance. And guess what? He's wrong. So that is that is my official pitch. He is he is a little shithead. That is quite accurate. And I love that. Um, all right. So now that we know a little bit about your books, um, we often talk about world building in fantasy books and sci-fi books, um, but we never really talk about that in contemporary. So that's the first topic I want to approach. Um, Emery Diary takes place in mostly Denver. Johnny, uh, 1500 Miles from the Sun takes place mostly in Texas with a little bit of California sprinkled in. So I'm wondering how familiar you two were with those places before writing the books and how you created those specific settings, like your version of cities that actually exist. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I love this question. Um, uh, I like Corpus Christi, where it like mostly takes place, was basically like my second home growing up, um, between that and like my actual hometown. Um, so I was really familiar with like the the setting and like the city and what's going on and stuff. Um, and that was like pretty easy for me just to kind of like go back and like consider all the things that like one might want to bring up in like setting and world building as far as like contemporary goes. Um, and I know that was like a big thing too when I was writing and like editing stuff. Like I know my editor was like, I want them to feel like they're in Corpus Christi. And like, so like we really like tried to get that feeling of like, when you read this, I want you to feel like you're like, in Corpus and like next to the shit water and like all of this stuff. And so we we really wanted to bring that. Um, and then I've taken two trips in my life to Los Angeles, but I've loved like both of them. And like, I love that city and um, kind of just use my knowledge of like getting lost and um, wild in Los Angeles as like just a key to bringing that to life. I can say as an Angelino that it is it did a really good job of making me miss home. So, listen. Well, okay, I, I have to. I have to give my feedback on this one because <laughs> because I I, well, I live in California now. I live just outside of LA, and I but I'm not from California. So like literally the way that Johnny describes like like California on like on like Jules's first visit was so fucking funny to me because I was here like. Oh my god, that's literally what I looked like when I first came <laughs> when, I, when I visited the first time. Like, this, this is a stupid tourist that everybody hates, but like you know that he's like feeling himself. You know he's feeling it. Like it's it's great. Like I love it. Like it's it's a, it's such a like like escapist view of like LA, but like it really does capture like what LA actually feels like. That's true. Yeah. And Emery, what about Denver? Um, so okay, so I have a rule, and this is like my my contemporary writing rule is that I will never write any location that I've never actually been to. So any book that you read by me, if there's a location in it, I've been there probably for at least a somewhat extended period of time. Um, but I've been to Colorado a couple of times. I've only been to like Denver, Denver once. Um, but like the entire concept behind like the story, like the reason I based it in Denver was because it was inspired by a real life near meet cute that a friend of mine actually had while we were road tripping from Florida to California and we stopped in Denver. Um, and so that was like where the whole thing happened. So that was, was like the entire concept of like Noah moving like across the country was just me taking my literal trip and just implanting him in the middle of it. Um, so it was basically like, there were like a couple places that were like plucked that I was like, oh, you know what? We went to that ice cream shop. Let's just make an ice cream shop. It's like exactly like it, but like a different name so we don't get sued. But then there was like the rest, like everything that's like, like that feels very like, like, you know, recognizable is actually inspired by like a real place. And then some of like the vaguer stuff, like the, I mean the, um, like the summer camp, like that one's made up entirely, but like a lot of the like key aesthetic locations are just literally plucked and just name changes. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, I've, I've been to Denver once, and so, but I wouldn't be able to write something set in Denver because I didn't. I guess I don't pay attention that well. But like, um, <laughs> but no, I was. It was. It was. I'm. I'm just glad it was in a place where um, you usually don't see a lot of like contemporary books. Like I, I don't. I don't know if I've ever read another book in in Colorado. Anyway, um, so now that we've got our setting, I want to talk about characters. Um, I think you guys are going to talk a lot in the future at any event about your main characters. So I want to talk side characters. I think you guys both have really memorable side characters. Um, 
Johnny, you have Matt Pham, who is just like a himbo king. And I mean, all of Jules' friends are like, see, like feel very real and are funny in their own ways. Um, and then Emery, I would, I would die for Brian. <laughs> like, I, yes, yes. Yeah. So pure, another himbo king. Like, um, <laughs> like I love, I love Brian so much. So I, I'm wondering what your guys' approach to side characters was, whether they were sort of based on real people or if they had other character models. Um, if you were worried that the side characters were going to take the shine away from your narrator and you're like, oh no, I've created a monster. Like, um, so if you guys want to talk about that, Emery, you can go first. I, I always, I always like my side characters more than my main character and it's never intentional. Like I always start with this really like well fleshed out, well developed main character and I just sprinkle other people in and they always end up taking the spotlights. This is like totally normal for me. But like with, <laughs> with Brian specifically, which like is great because so no one in my family actually like follows my writing career at all. So nobody will know when I'm like shit talking them like I'm about to right now. So like Brian is like based off of my sister, like <laughs> very like heavily, like from like, you know, just like the absolute like ridiculousness, like the, the athleticness and the like, oh, you know, he's actually kind of smart, but like, does he show it? Never. Like <laughs> I was like, purely inspired by my sister. And just like generally like the fact that the way that like Noah is like constantly dragging Brian and Brian will like maybe drag Noah a little bit, but then Noah will just like stab him in the gut. Like that's again, like my relationship with my sister entirely. Um, so that was like, I feel like largely where the idea for like Brian came from was just like, how can I like bring my like experience with like sibling dynamics onto the page. Um, but the other side characters were all kind of just like, you know, when I write a love interest, it's like, oh, what are traits that are like really like romantic and cute? Ooh, I'll come up with like these things. And like, for, like the friend, like like with Becca, it was like, you know, what does no one need? Like what kind of friend does no one need to like reel him in? And that was largely like a lot of where like Becca's like personality came from. It was just kind of like, how do you balance out? Like, especially with a main character like Noah, who's a lot. It's like, how do you balance out that character so that the people around him are keeping him like in line while also yeah. still letting him like show off who he is. Um, so that was basically, it's basically I feel like a lot of like the side character energy kind of comes from when I'm originally like crafting the idea. And then they always just end up like taking the spotlight and being like super like funny and weird. So that just, yeah. Johnny? Um, yeah, so I think Matt in particular, like, I feel like he was always probably going to be portrayed as, like, this kind of close to perfect sort of character, but also because, like, you don't really get to see him in person except for, like, one instance. And so there's this, like, their relationship is really just based on, like, what they present to each other, like, on FaceTime and, like, through text messages and DMs. And so I really wanted to portray that kind of like relationship too where like i mean it's very authentically him but also like maybe a little bit like touched up so that he's only like Joel is only getting a certain like like a really good versus like the really bad um and that kind of just made him like the sunshiny character that he is um and then with like his friend group i i got a lot of inspiration off of like media that i really enjoy um specifically like on my block on netflix and um Simon versus the Homo sapiens agenda. Like I really took like those friend groups and I was like, okay, like how do I make a friend group that's like this badass? Because I like I love like those sort of like how they're just really tight knit and like you can just tell from the get-go that they're just like really like day ones and got those back. And so I wanted that. And then just building on personality, um, I like had one quality about each of them, like whether it was like Deep Cell being kind of like the smart alecky sort of person or like Jordan being like the, the one who's like super supportive of all time or like Lou being just like the most wild person in the entire world. Like taking like one thing of them and then sort of making like a birth chart for them and like figuring out what like their signs are and that way I can figure out like, okay, like here's their personality and how do I like differentiate that to make them all not seem like the same person. Emery, are you into astrology at all? I, not like Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I don't I don't know too much. I know like the basic, but that makes a lot of sense for your characters, Johnny, yeah. because like some of them I'm like, huh, like, well, oh, you're a Sagittarius, right? Yeah. 
I am. Are there any Sagittarii in the book? Yeah, um, Jules is. His birthday is December 12th. Um, and Lou is. Yeah. And Lou is Sagittarius. Yeah, I think I knew Lou was a fire sign. Anyway, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> it's pretty obvious she was a fire sign. Um, <laughs> Jordan is too. He's a Leo. I love Jordan. I love Jordan. <laughs> King. Um, cool. All right. So the next thing we're, we're building your books, right? That's what we're going through right now. We have the setting, we have the characters. Now I want to talk about, um, timelines. So Emery, meet you diary takes place over the course of a summer. Johnny, um, 1500 miles from the sun takes place over the course of a school year. Um, so I'm wondering how you guys came up with the time frame and what that meant in terms of pacing and things you were trying to achieve with with <laughs> with um, with your timelines with your with the amount of time that you gave your characters to figure their shit out. Sounds like you got a good answer, Emery. Why don't you go first? We're all waiting, Emery. Well, what it meant in terms of pacing was a lot of my agent and my editor being like. You know these dates don't make sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> because, so I, I mean, I think you both know I'm I'm a I'm a pantser. I don't plan anything out like pretty much before I start writing. So like when I when I for my first draft is always like a mess. Like it's just always ridiculous. But like even this one, because this is the book that I signed with my first agent off of. Like even this one, which was fully revised and everything by the time it got to my first agent, my editor still was like plucking out like this time, this doesn't make sense. Like you skipped like a week here. And like, why are these times all off? I don't, I, I, and here's the thing I've done, I've done what Johnny did with like the school year, like timeline thing. And it was the biggest mistake of my life. There's nothing harder than trying to, there's nothing, no, no, there's nothing harder. Like, like I can write like 20 years in a high fantasy, but if you try to make me write a school year and actually get the timing right, it's gonna be bullshit. It's never gonna work. I can't pace that for my life. So I was like, okay, a summer, that'll be easy. It's three months. <laughs> and it still didn't make sense. It was still all wrong. Like to this day, I, I like there's there's a part there's a Christmas in July party and that's like nearing the end of the book and like even just making it make sense that that party ended up in July was like the world's biggest like stressor for me I couldn't make it happen because everything didn't line up right and it was just horrible and I'm just all I'm saying is like if anyone is like hey how did you pace this book like don't ask me ask somebody who knows what they're doing I'm gonna drive you off a cliff. I mean, I mean, the final product makes a lot of sense. It feels, you know, like a like a summer. Um, so, and that's what we're aiming for. I'm so, just saying that I was not the one who did it. <laughs> well, kudos to your editor. <laughs> and Johnny, how did you do but this? Also, like, time is a scam and like <laughs> trying to do dates. Like, that's the worst part of writing contemporary is like everyone knows the calendar. So you can't fuck that up. Like that's that's the worst. Um, and like writing stories now that have like a shorter timeline is the absolute worst. Uh, but this one taking like mainly in the course of a school year, but also like basically a whole year, calendar year. Um, I, I like, I wanted. I think like, the most meaningful part that my like agent and editors helped me get is like making sure that each chapter has a purpose and like drives the storyline, because. A lot of it was like doing, I know like earlier drafts had like, oh, like every single major holiday is like mentioned. And like, they were like, why does this need to be a thing? Like, why do we need to see him making Thanksgiving? Why do we need to see like this shit and that shit? And it's like, I don't know, because it's cute. And so like, they like, they really like stress. Like if we're going to include a chapter, it can't just be like him cooking again for like the eighth time. Like we get it, he knows how to cook. And so <laughs> it was a lot of just like, inserting things that were going to drive the story forward and not make it seem like we were either stuck in like the same week for forever or like the jumping around seemed to like be a little bit too um too hard to comprehend and i know there are parts where, especially like in the second half where like we kind of do a little jump forward that's like a little a little bit more than i think the first half but like wanting to make sure that like we can still keep up with what's happening and where it's going and like what at least the month is maybe. Um, 
and just like really i know my copy editor like did a whole like excel sheet of like here's like each day and month and what's happening in each chapter on those months like we have to make sure that we get that right and i'm like oh my god okay like <laughs> we'll see yeah, yeah. like yeah, i feel like for me it was like i did I can do like the stuff happening. Like I can make it where every chapter matters, but I can't make it where the chapters actually span time. So it'll be like, oh cool, like 20 chapters where important things happen, but then it turns out that was all like four days. And then you're like. And I think like, I like to like, in the beginning chapters, like span like a day and a day and a day, like almost like, like a week happening. And that way like they get like a good sense of like what the story is and what the characters are before I kind of like, push on the gas and like, okay, now we're going forward and now we're just like not gonna look back. So like in the beginning of the book, you have like a Sunday, a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, like and then the next week, like a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday sort of situation before I really start going like, okay, now next week and now next month. So that way they kind of get a handle on like what the story is before I just start throwing them places. My problem is that I would, I, whenever I try to do like, whenever I try to do like, like slow and steady, what I end up doing is it's like, it's either like the first like, few days are too boring and nothing happens or it's like everything happens at once like i never ha i never know how to balance it's like if you're like you don't know have like, like a cake and you're trying to like frost your cake and you're just like you just cannot get it even like you just either have like a shit ton of frosting like, <laughs> like on one side or like not enough on the other. like i think like that's what it is with like like stuff like once i like put stuff and i think part of it's because again like i said i don't plot i just write it and see what happens but it's like when i try to like spread out stuff evenly so there's actually stuff going on like every day it doesn't it doesn't work that way for me it's always like everything or like nothing yeah, yeah. i think of like um john mulaney has a has a bit in his stand-up about like writing happy birthday on a sign. And he's like, big <laughs> ass H, big ass A. And then it, like the letters get smaller because you didn't account for like the space that you actually have. And so like, that's that's me too when I'm writing. Like this is why they hate us. It takes place over the course of a summer. And the first thing my agent made me do was make my own calendar and be like, take a look at what, like, what's happening. And like, tell me if that's crazy. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Like. At some points, he's like, so 10 days ago, and it's like, and then 20 things happen on the same day. Um, but I think I think you guys got it right by the end, which is all that matters. That's true. All right, <laughs> next question. So looking at your guys' covers and hearing the synopses, you kind of get this feel that it's like very light, very fun, which is true of your books. Um, but while I was reading, I was like, not surprised, but I was like, okay, yeah, they're doing this. Like, Emery, we have like, you know, misgendering of the main character. There's talk of a trans character, um, unnamed at the time who, who you know, tried to co commit suicide after, after coming out. Um, and Johnny, your book deals with a father who's emotionally and then, you know, physically abusive. So there was, you know, this heavy, um, these were, there, there were these heavy elements to your books that, um, were mixed in with the light and the fun and the, you know, the, 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 ro the romance and the, the comedy for everything a queer kid could want, but sadly also the reality that, that we live in. So how did you guys balance that? And I guess that's the question, like, how did you balance reality with, you know, the escapism that, that we all want from these books? <laughs> it took a lot of like dragging me into like letting myself write those tougher things um like beta readers were very much like seeing the potential for you know like those kinds of scenes they had like a little bit of them it started out really not as like emotional and i guess like tough as it is now but then i knew i wanted to make it like closer to what it is now and so it was like a, a journey towards that with like beta readers telling me like hey like maybe think of this uh conversation with a developmental editor like how far can we take it um so like the tougher parts were definitely a lot of them were added after the cutesy stuff it was probably like a lot more cutesy than like it is now um but i knew that i wanted that mixture i knew that i wanted like definitely heavy stuff in there um just because like i feel like as queer people like that that is our lives like we're very much like a mixture of like joy 
and not joy. Um, and a lot of that joy is like joy that we create on our own, that we have in our own heads that allows us to just get up in the morning. And so I wanted like all of that to be in there. And yeah, I, I, um, and I mean, like, it's, you know, don't be surprised to anyone, but just read the author's note. I can see this in there. Um, oh my God. <laughs> I'm doing that, I keep hitting it and I'm like, oh, you don't notice. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it was just a practice in getting my trauma on page. I'm glad you did it. <laughs> it was it was very um, cathartic to to read about other people's read about another person's dealing with that. It is it is I, I think really important. And so yeah, believe the author's note because I didn't. I was like, oh Johnny, <laughs> no. Oh, People will talk about it on Twitter, like, oh my God, it's so funny. Like, oh, it's already so funny. And it's like, don't be, like, yes, it is. But also, like, maybe, like, you know, they, I had people cry. Maybe let's talk about that for a second, too. That way they aren't just, like, super caught off guard. Yeah. I mean, like, not to, like, not to be dramatic, but I did have to, like, stop reading your book temporarily while I was reading it. Because I was not, I wasn't expecting it. So I went into it, like, <laughs> long distance relationship. And then, like, I, so, like, there's, like, one scene that, like, vividly stands out in my mind. Because I remember being, like, long break like I took a break for like a day which for me is like not like really not a lot but I was like okay wait give me give me a second I, I, need, I, need, I need to think about this yeah. <laughs> but like but I, it, it, I feel like that by the end though it's like there's so much happiness and like humor and stuff that you almost forget that that happened at the beginning so you're like oh right yeah. <laughs> um I feel like in my book though it was almost the opposite of like what Johnny was talking about because for me I actually went into it with like maybe i'll include like a little bit like the the misgendering that you mentioned like i did that was originally in the book like i was like initial plan was i was like i want to show some of the stuff that happens like to queer people and like what it's like to have i don't want to say like support through it because i feel like that makes it seem like it's like you know this like huge explosive thing but kind of just like having like people who stand by you and like always support you like even when like stuff goes bad so that was kind of like part of my intention, like, as far as like, like that, like part specifically. Um, but I actually had a lot of feedback throughout, which is, was honestly really hard to hear, but I had a lot of feedback throughout where everyone was like, shouldn't there be more trauma here? Like, why are people okay with, like, why do people accept his transness so easily? Why isn't he getting misgendered more? Like, why aren't there, like, like I, I literally had comments like, um, you know, why is he so confident? Shouldn't he be like, Shouldn't he be like afraid of like, you know, walking places and getting misgendered? Shouldn't he be like worried that people are looking at him and not seeing him as a real boy? And I was just like, oh, no, 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 no. Like, we're not doing that here. Like, that is not what this book is about. No. Like, and like, I do feel like, you know, and and like, I feel like it's, it's like Johnny said, like, I feel like in a lot of ways, like queer people, we are a balance of like joy, but like also like, you know, we're marginalized for a reason. Um, but I feel like too, like I feel like sometimes, I feel like sometimes people forget that like everyone's experience is uniquely different. Like I have not experienced a lot of like overt transphobia like to my face. Ninety nine point nine percent of transphobia I experience is like on like social media or something like you know with trolls and like people like actively like targeting you. Um, but in terms of like my day to day life, like I live in Southern California. I used to live in a, another like major city. Like I always been around like relatively liberal people even even when i went to catholic school surprisingly enough um so like to show noah's experience i wanted it to be like you know escapist in a way but like also still kind of like balancing that like you know yes there are people who are ignorant around you yes you will experience ignorance but it's never like a big part of like noah's journey like even like for like we were talking about um you know the trans character who had tried to commit suicide like that's something that Noah mentions at the beginning of the book, and it's something that comes up again later. Um, but a lot of it is kind of like in passing or like addressed as like something that has happened before, but like has been moved on from. So the emphasis is more on like the, you know, recovered from that. It's now like in like 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 I said, like with the with the misgendering, it's not the misgendering happens really quick, and then the emphasis is on like 
having somebody support you like and taking your side against it and saying like no like it's not okay they're not allowed to mistreat you so like that was kind of like the emphasis on the story was kind of like yeah these things are here but like you know we can acknowledge they're there and then just keep going like, we don't have to stop and like focus on it a lot and i think it was just largely because one like i said i don't feel like you see that a lot um and like i mean you don't see trans characters a lot period but i feel like even when I, someone goes like what's your favorite trans story i'm like well, i really like pose but like that's not happy <laughs> like, <laughs> like <laughs> you know like pose is great if you yeah. want to cry like the entire time so it was kind of like how can i try to balance out all of the trauma that people associate with being trans like from other media by making this story like not emphasize that stuff so yeah. Well, again, I, I, I said that's the other question, but it's like, it's like um, am I echoing? A little bit. Is that me? I wonder. It stops. Okay. A little bit. Sorry. <laughs> um, but I say this every time, but I think you guys um, struck that balance, and that's why I'm asking you about this. Um, like, you guys did really well with everything I'm asking you about. And that's why I'm asking you about it so that people can learn from it. So I can learn from it. So my cat can learn from it. Um, but yeah, no, I think it was, it was uh, properly, properly balanced. Um, so we have an audience question and it just so happens to coincide with question number five. Um, the audience members question is way better worded. <laughs> I'm just going to read it. Do you have word count targets for each chapter or does each moment take as long as it needs and you'll tweak it and edit? <laughs> he didn't, I mean, sorry, our, our audience member did not ask if you have too many chapters. Question like calls you out. <laughs> like I feel like that just happened. Like I was like I was gonna ask about word count for a book. Okay. <laughs> well, actually, so, so my question um, actually is just a bunch of word count questions. So we can have that too. So uh, what was? Can you talk about the word count journey for your book? You know, first draft to final draft. Um, yes, word count of, of chapters and then number of chapters. Let's get into the nitty gritty. Okay, well, um, I have um, I I write short chapters, um, and that's I don't I don't know why I do. I just write short chapters um, on average. Like on a Microsoft Word document, they're about like maybe like six pages on average, uh, which is probably like maybe eighteen thousand words. Um, in 18, a chapter, 100. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know math. Um, <laughs> 1800 words in a chapter um yeah i don't i think it's more just like whenever i'm reading i like to have a lot of places where i can just like take a break like if i want and so i think that was kind of like a self insert for me like there's a lot of moments where you just like the end of a chapter if you want to put it away for a minute and like i don't know go take a bathroom break like there you go here's a moment um so yeah like my chapters are like short there's a lot of them there's like 60 of them and 1500 miles from the sun um and as far as like the work count of the manuscript the first draft was at 69,000 words um and then the final giraffe or the final what it, what it is now um oh my god that cat so cute. Um, <laughs> the final version of 1500 miles from the sun is at 90,000 words which is pretty i think pretty long for a, a book i like always try to shoot for seventy five thousand because i think i saw like adam silvera once list all of his like word counts for his books and like the contemporary ones seem to have like a mean of like seventy five thousand. and so i was like that's like a good number for a contemporary wife so that's what i shoot for i have not done that yet they've all been kind of longer or like dramatically shorter but like seventy five thousand is like the ideal in my perspective of what like a good contemporary YA book would land at. If any, but like, I always think of like, I had an English professor who told us that like our papers should be as short as possible, but as long as necessary. And so I usually just go with that, like make it as short as you can, but like as long as it needs to be. And that's, that's where it should land. I actually like that a lot. I'm not gonna lie, I'm gonna steal yeah. it. Uh <laughs> 
I, okay, so I give Johnny a lot of shit because their chapters are really short. But like, you you would not believe from reading Meet Cute Diary because Meet Cute Diary has twelve chapters. But I usually write really short chapters too. They're longer than Johnny's, but like, I still write short chapters. <laughs> <laughs> like, generally, I'll have like thirty to like thirty to maybe forty chapters, depending. Uh, with Miku Diary, it was different because I specifically numbered the chapters based on his 12 steps. So, like, because I needed them to be 12 chapters exactly, the chapters are massive. Um, and I actually got I actually got crap for that. I got a revise and resubmit from an agent. They were like, um, your chapters are too long. And I was like, listen, it's for the aesthetic. Like, it's literally just for the aesthetic. Let it be. Um, but so that was, like, a thing. But, yeah, so... Those chapters are super long, but I do have a lot of section breaks. Like you, you probably notice it's like like blog posts and stuff like interrupt the sections because that's where I would normally probably end a chapter if not for the fact that like I needed these stupid 12 steps to be like the aesthetic of the, the, the sections. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have a chapter goal like length wise. I feel like it's just kind of like whatever I try to like, I try to usually capture like one major like point in every chapter like so usually it's like a combination of like some character development a plot point and like a certain level of emotion and like that's just like the goal of the chapter and like I kind of have that in mind as I write I don't always but that's generally whatever power long that takes it takes so I have chapters that are like two pages and I have chapters that are like 20 pages in like the same book often yeah um, my, my, <laughs> Me Cute Diaries first draft was 57,000, I think, because it was a nano book. Um, and a lot of my books are nano books. So they always start, they will usually end just over 50K because I'm trying to hit the word count. Um, so it was, yeah, 57, but now it's 80-ish, I think. I, I was trying to keep it under 80 because people always say, which is a lie, by the way, don't listen. People always say contemporary YA should be less than 80,000 words. That's such a lie. Like so many contemporary YAs sell at way higher than 80. The trick though, I mean, it's like if you're querying is if you keep it under 80, it's better because then your agent will probably increase your word count. But for me, I was like, oh, I have to keep it under 80. So I was working so hard. And then when we got like the final round of edits in, it ended up being like 80,000 and like four or something. And I was like, <laughs> like I can't believe this after everything. Uh, yeah, so that's, but I feel like my, my general like goal when I draft is like 60 to 70. I, I announced on Twitter the other day that I finished my first first draft that actually went over 70. It was like 70,000, like 12 or something. And I was just like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is why they hate us started out at 52,000. It's currently at 88,000. Um, and I still have a couple of, because when I, it's weird when I edit, I'm, I'm adding stuff. I'm not really cutting too much because um, I'm an underwriter. Um, and the chapters, I think my shortest chapter is probably the length of one of Johnny's, which is like 1,800 words. And then I have some chapters just that are like double that because, because what is consistency? And um, I, I originally was like pretty insecure about that. And I'm like, no, they all need to be a uniform length. But I'm reading other people's books and I'm like, no, like chapters can, some can be short and some can be longer. Um, and it's, just, it's a fun mix, depends on what's happening in the chapter. It's like- Whatever it calls for, whatever it calls for. I've seen people like consider books that manage to have like a one page chapter to be like literary masterpieces because they've defied the rules by making like only one page, like like that, like as powerful as a whole chapter. And so like if people can think that that's a literary masterpiece, they can't complain when I have one like chapter that's like three pages and one that's like 37, like still. Yeah. Um, my next question is kind of, you <laughs> might think it's a little frivolous, but I just really wanted to ask it. Um, you both used, or have to had to come up with usernames, and I'm just fascinated by the process by which you came up with usernames. Um, Emery, I think you had to do Tumblr ones, and then Johnny, yours are, are Twitter handles, I believe. Um, so can you talk me through the process? Because I'm sure you're like, you want them to be funny, but you don't want them to be too clever, because then people are like, are usual usernames that clever, like that sort of thing? So there's like a balance to be struck there. Um, Emery, do you want to start? Okay, so I'm gonna say first rule is you have to go based on the platform you're writing for. 
So like on Tumblr, people are people have like like there's like I don't know like four forms that people use. There's like super emo, angsty, like you know like MCR lyrics. Then there's like absolute nonsense, like that literally means nothing. Then there's like <laughs> weird like thirst traps, and then there's like variations of people's names. So like essentially those were like what I was aiming for as I like wrote them. It was either like, you know, I mean, God, I, some, some of them are really bad. Some of them are literally just Easter eggs. Like everyone on Twitter was talking about Ooh Knife Daddy for a while. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ooh Knife Daddy. It was something my friend made up. So I put it in the book just so that he would see it. And then of course, First, like you know, now everybody's like, "Oh my god, oh my god, daddy, that's so funny!" And then like, you know, so there's that. And then there was like, like the other day, my um, I got like an inquiry from like my my editor, like, um, so they're working on the audiobook, um, and they have a couple questions, and it was like, how do you pronounce this? And it's like, <laughs> and I'm like, it's a keyboard smash. I just, I just, I didn't realize. I didn't think about the audiobook. I didn't think yeah. I was gonna actually pronounce this. Oh, oh my god, now so, I'm just thinking about that. You know, <laughs> advice, never write a keyboard smash and do your book because then you have to like explain to people or even just like I made stuff that was like random like puns and like jokes and stuff and like having to explain it to people so <laughs> they would know how to pronounce it is so embarrassing. Just don't do it. Just make everyone's handle like someone's name with like a number in it. You're safer that way. <laughs> I'm think. I have a keyboard smash too, and now I'm wondering, like, I, I'm wondering about my poor audiobook narrator, how they're gonna do that. I can't wait. Um, but yeah, so the Twitter ones, I mean, mainly it's like Jules's and Matt's, and like Jules's fake one um, is based off of a really popular Ariana Grande gif, um, at and what about it, where she's like just standing there, like, in the pictures, and like, and what about it, like that Ariana Grande gif. I love that. Um, yeah, like it's iconic, and like Jules is an alienator, so like of course that's what he would have. And then um, his real one is like La Mala Luna because like his last name is Luna. Um, and then Matt's is Sunny Side Up, and like that originally was because whenever I like started drafting, his first name was Sunny, based off of like this person I knew in high school whose name was like Son, I think, but like went by Sonny and so like that was his name and so it was like S-O-N-N-Y side up but then I changed to Matt and like just switched to like the right like um and then like two and three because of like um and there's like a few like that was like are briefly mentioned like in one chapter that are mo mostly um taken from like queer twitter like ads like I know there's like God stands Luna and like Goku's baby mama and like trashy homo and like these are all kind of like close to like what I've seen like just gay Twitter like make and I'm like I, I need something chaotic like these and so like I just kind of like let myself have fun with those but like I try with Jules and Matt I try to incorporate it like into like their identities and like their names Awesome. Um, I am literally Goku's baby mama. Anyway, um, so we have a question uh, in the in the chat. What is everyone's writing process? How much prep do you do before you start writing? And also, how do you go about picking which idea to write? So my fifteen hundred miles from the sun was the second idea that I had after the first one. Like, I started writing and just wasn't going anywhere, so I just threw it away for the time being. Um, and I, I usually pants. So I mean, I kind of like do like a mixture. I don't. It, it kind of it changes. I don't know. I don't know what I do yet. But like, <laughs> I've like pants a few. I've like plotted one. I've done like an in between. I don't know. It's just kind of like. You, so with 1500 Miles in the Sun and what I did with my other books on my pants, I will like have an idea and I'll just kind of like draft it, pants it. But then while I'm pantsing it, I will take notes. Like, I'll, like, I'll actually write it down. I like to write down the notes of like things that I'll come back and do later. Because if I'm pantsing, I don't want to like go back to the chapter or the scene that I just wrote and focus on that. Like it's not what I think pantsing. Pantsing is just going forward. Like there's no looking back. So like if I have an idea or a thing I want to focus on or like something that needs to be made, made better or think about, like I'll write it down. And then in the second round, I'll like 
that's when that gets thought about and that's when they basically just throw in every single idea that I have in that second round. And so that just like, especially because of an underwriter too. So like, I'll just throw out anything that I can think of into that second draft. And then the third draft, I'll start like thinking like, okay, like let's kind of make this break out. Um, and that's usually like my process is just like this, this three step thing. And then after that, it's kind of going about it until I feel like I can't make it any better myself. And to yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I'm telling Johnny where I, I can't say that I have like a process um, because it does change like every time. Um, but like basically, my my planning goes from like depending on it's usually based on like the intricacy of the world building, like how much I expect, like how intricate I expect the world building to be before I start. Um, because if I know that the world building is going to be really complex, or if it's like, like for instance, in the case of Me Cute Diary, like I planned out a couple of things that like I knew were going to be like super consistent throughout. Like, for instance, what were his twelve steps, um, and like, you know, what that entailed and everything like that. Like that stuff, I'll like plan out beforehand. And I'll just kind of like jot it down, and it's usually like a note that I'll just like have like on my phone. Um, and then like like for instance i just wrote a fantasy that was like the most complex world building i've ever done in my life and like that one i had to plan out like world building beforehand because otherwise the story would have made no sense um but like other times i'll literally like i've sat down to write a book and not even known what the main character's name was and just like said whatever i'm just gonna wing it and then like at some point been like we'll throw a name in here and like you know <laughs> whatever like i don't know um so like it kind of it kind of depends a lot as far as like what i work on like i have adhd so like, I, I I have a note of like seventeen thousand ideas, and like I'll just kind of like occasionally open it up, and like if one of them, like pretty much I like it's what it is is like I'll read it over, and my brain will like fixate on something, and it'll just start running with it like before I can even decide that I want to work on it, and then it's like well fuck it I guess I have to, and then that's usually whatever I end up working on next. Yeah, I forgot to answer that second part. Um... But yeah, much like Emery, like I like just will like be bombarded with a bunch of ideas. And usually I'm the type of person who's like, okay, I'm just gonna start writing it because I have no patience. And I'll get to like 3,000 words and realize that I don't know what I'm doing and I'll just give up. Um, but what I found most effective after like a year of trying to write a second book and like not getting anywhere is, and like this was to my agent but even if you don't have an agent like if you have some kind of accountability person who like you can like do this with i wrote a i chose i chose like an, an idea out of all the ones that i've tried and was like okay i'm gonna do this one and that's what i'm gonna stick with and then i wrote a synopsis for it and then i sent that synopsis to my agent and was like if you like it i will continue writing it and they're like yes write this so like if you don't have an agent like but you have someone who can keep you accountable like write that synopsis send that synopsis because when if you write a synopsis, you already have an idea of like what the book is going to look like. Even if it changes, like at least you thought about it in a way that's like from beginning to middle to end. So like do that and you already put in more effort than you probably would have regardless. And then send it to someone who can hold you accountable and <laughs> be like, okay, I'm going to write this. And that way they know and like they're going to keep you in check, hopefully, like ideally. They might stab you if you don't. <laughs> you remember what I said in the group chat the other day, Johnny? See, now I've admitted we have a group chat. <laughs> no. Let me guess who else is in it. <laughs> Nora? <laughs> what? No! No! Listen. Not anymore. <laughs> listen, I, I would never talk to Johnny by choice, okay? We don't have a group chat. But in the group chat the other day, as I was telling you, I was like, <laughs> I'm like, I, if I write a synopsis, I can't write a book. Like literally once the synopsis is written, the book is trash. It's going in the garbage. <laughs> like it's just never going to happen. But I will say I have done similar to like what you were saying about like, like sending out a synopsis, but what I'll do is I'll write like the first chapter and then I'll send it and be like, what do y'all think? Is this good? And then like, if they're like, yeah, that's great. Or if they're like, yeah, then like. I mean, usually it's a shitty synopsis that like lacks in plot at, like, at all. Like, <laughs> and I. I feel like Claire can attest to that because like they replied with like write this but also think about what happens. Like something <laughs> <so> happens. <laughs> and I was like, cool, I will keep that in mind, but no promises. But yeah, like at least you have some kind of again, some kind of thought of like beginning, middle, and end. Cool. Um, so I'm a I'm a pantser. Um, and I'm also a binge I never when people say process, I don't know if they mean that or like like how you actually write. 
Um, I consider myself like a binge writer because I don't write every day. And I sort of just, when I feel inspired, I just don't stop doing it until I'm hungry and tired. You know, like I just, I'll just keep doing it because I want to. And then if I don't write the next day, then I don't really care because I don't want to. Like I just always go based on my emotions. Um, I wrote three books before This Is Why They Hate Us, and each of them were pants, but I knew where I was going. This Is Why They Hate Us was the first one that I wrote chronologically, like chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. And I sort of, you know, I had an idea of where I wanted it to go, but that's why it was such a mess in edits because I mentioned in chapter 16 for the first time that the main character was mentally ill. And it's like, my, you know, when my, when, when I signed with my agent, one of the first edits besides the calendar was also like, you need to you need to thread this. <laughs> like you need to <laughs> hint at it. You need to do something about the fact that in chapter 16, he just goes through a massive like depressive spiral and it was never mentioned before. Um, so like that's why um, editing that book was so hard because it was, it was pants so thoroughly, like without any sort of foresight. Um, and I, I pick the ideas based on what I can't let go of in my head. Um, I was actually trying to finish a different book. I was like 90% done with a book when I started writing This Is Why They Hate Us. And it's like, I, I had so much less to do with that book because it was almost done. But I just couldn't not write This Is Why They Hate Us. And it was also like the first queer book that I wrote. All the other ones were straight. Um, and so it was just, it was the one that like, I just kept thinking about when I wasn't writing it. And so like, that's, you know, that's how I went with that to write. Alrighty. Um, we're kind of a tiny bit running out of time. So I think I'm going to skip two of my questions and go to the last one. Um, this one is a really difficult question for any writer, um, or maybe not, I don't know. But a lot of writers think about this a lot and it's audience. So. I personally, I write for myself. I do what makes me laugh. I do what I want to see. Um, what is it called? Like, reader, what is it called when you give the reader exactly what they want? Fan service? Uh, fan service. Yeah. <laughs> I, I fan service myself. Um, and, <laughs> and so, like, I, I do that, but at a certain point, you any writer who's who's going the traditionally published route has to think about an audience who's going to buy your book. So I'm wondering what you two have to say about that in terms of, yes, writing a book for yourself and your younger self or kids like you and, you know, all that stuff, but also knowing that you have to go through a system, again, for traditional publishing, you have to go through this system that's going to try to, I don't want to say exploit, but but make you as marketable as possible, right? To make your book as universal as possible. So I'm wondering what, you know, drafting, editing, all those stages of your book coming to be, like how you guys balance in your head, like this is a book for this group in my head, but I also do want, you know, people to buy the book, like people who are and wouldn't understand everything that goes into it. Um, so have at it. <laughs> that, that was a vaguely formed question, but I'm sure, I hope that you have some things to say about that. So like for me, I feel like, like my ideal reader um, is actually not myself. It used to be myself and then I got smarter about it. Now my ideal reader is actually my roommate because she's she has essentially the same standards that I do as far as like things that she likes, as far as like, you know, like wanting things to be like accurately diverse and like that kind of stuff. Um, but she's a very, she's a very marketable taste. Like she tends to like everything that's really popular. Like, you know, she was like a hardcore directioner and like, you know, like she's just very like, like, you know, she just, she's just very like, like, and it's not even that she's like following the trends. It's just that the types of trends that become trends are the types of things that she likes. So like, keeping in mind like just because i like 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 i'm like oh i like this like gruesome gory thing that only three other people are gonna read no she'll be like um i'm like okay you're right you're right i know this um so like i do i trust like her feedback um and then like i feel like and, and it's hard i feel like it's different too like when you have an agent when you have an editor like when you have somebody who's supposed to be your gatekeeper i feel like my response is like don't be your own gatekeeper like don't 
force yourself to like pre like screen out things that you do want in the book and that are, are important to you in the book because you're like, oh, well, the market's not going to like, you know, there's a difference between like, you know, waiting for the market to actually tell you that versus like, you know, whether or not you actually, you know, are thinking that. But like, I feel like, and this is like, honestly, like a problem I literally just had that I feel like was like really like an issue for me. But it's just like, for me, it kind of comes down to like, is this an opinion or is this a lack of experience? Um, because like I said, I write a lot of own voices stuff. So like my goal with everything I write is to thoroughly reflect the experience that I'm writing about. So like if I'm writing a trans story and someone's like, I don't think this is realistic or like, why isn't he like, you know, afraid of getting outed or like things like that. I'm going to say, you know, as a trans person, that's not my experience. Like, I don't feel like that's something that needs to be in a book to make a book good, so I'm not going to do it. And when it comes to a matter of, like, identity, a matter of, like, those types of, like, experiences where it's, like, look, I'm the expert on my own experience. You can't tell me that it's not my experience. That's not how things work. Like, I'm going to side with myself. When it comes to things like, you know, aesthetic or, like, you know, what, you know, like, 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 is this plot tight enough? Is How's the pacing? Like, that kind of stuff, like, I, I defer. Like, I, I will, like, if it's, like, hardcore like opposite of what i want to do like i'll discuss but like you know i feel like once you have an agent and once you have an editor or like just anyone that you know is like obviously a better expert on like what can sell than you are i feel like there reaches a point where you just kind of say okay look like i'm gonna trust that you know what you're doing and i'm gonna like you know let you do that thing unless it's so like you know counterintuitive to literally who i am as a person that it's like i can't i can't sell that i can't put that out in the world for me like i definitely write from like a particular perspective and like i i do that like purposefully i don't necessarily think it's for myself um but also like i do the consideration that, like i grew up in a very like white town in southeast texas and don't necessarily have the like community or like social sphere to be like really proud of like who i am as like a chicana or like a mexican-american person and so going to San Antonio for college and like finally being able to like be surrounded by like other Mexican Americans and like be like consumed by that sort of experience and being like proud of that for the first time in like 19, 20 years. That's something that I really do want to write about. It's something that like I particularly in for young adults, like I want to write like that for like I guess the person that I was at like 17, 18 who couldn't experience that. Um but also, I mean, I just write, like, what I find interesting personally. Like, I find, like, I don't know, I find, like, Jules's story interesting. And I find, like, things like immigration and, like, mariachi interesting. And um, and I get that, like, a lot in, like, in, like, Zacarias and, and stuff like that. And so, like, I feel like that all, like, speaks and can, like, sometimes be formed to have a very strict, like, Tejane, like, Mexican-American perspective. And, like... You know, I have had those like moments where like I don't really understand like what what like the whole thing is happening here. Like I have, I've had to like explain to like editors like this is just like the culture. Like here we are. But also like I feel like from my from my own perspective, the best way that I think I can adapt to like have mass marketability is through voice and like just making like especially the main characters compelling enough to where even if you don't understand their perspective and experience that you can at least like feel like you're with them through that journey and feel like like they're your friend or they're just someone that you can like be with for however long it takes you to read them and enjoy them regardless of if you're you know queer or mexican american or any of those identities that my characters might have and like as long as i can make them lovable and like worthy of that embrace like not even worthy that's a stupid thing that's a stupid thing but like to have like a mass market like want to consume that sort of thing like then i think that that's what my focus is unnecessarily on like making sure the experience is something that can be consumable for I don't, I don't know straight white girls but like that like they would want to be my main character's friends regardless of if they understand their perspectives cool that was so great to hear from you too about that because it's like inspiring for me um and i if it you know i hope that's the case for the audience as well all right, really quick, we have another audience question from Alexia. Um, would you ever co-write a book? And I'm going to add, if you 
would co-write a book with who? I know Johnny's answer, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, Marie. <laughs> well, my answer? Uh, are you on no, you know, listen, Emery and I are going to write our enemies to even more harshly set enemies. That's going to be the new trope. Um, so look out for that book. Um, but yeah, but um, my, I would I would love to write a book with um, Aiden Thomas. That's my like, that's what I would, I would love to do that with. I'm like, I, I have multiple answers. Like I, I, I have like friends I'm like, I would co-write with. And I have like dream authors, like, oh my God, can you imagine if I could co-write a book with? Um, so I guess like, I mean, yeah, like I'll co-write a book with Johnny if I have to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, I mean, my, I would love to co-write a book with Adam Silvera if he's, if he ever wants to, like, I would be open to that. Yeah, <laughs> so I, yeah I, don't, I don't think I would ever be able to co-write a book. It's just, I get, I, I don't know if I could be able to do that, but it would have to be someone that I like idolize. Um, so I think I would think I would pick Adam Silvera as well. Um, oh wait, are we gonna fight? Her? <laughs> oh, no, no, I, I'd rather not. I'd rather not fight you first of all, and then second of all, I'd rather not co-write a book. But like, if you know, like in a fantasy world where 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 I guess people could fly and shit, like, and then Adam Silvera was like, Aaron, I need you to write a book with me. I'd be like, okay, I guess that like. That's how that's <laughs> what it would have to go down. Like, I just don't like. Um, I mean, there are definitely lots of authors who I think flowers. would like, in like a perfect world, would be like, oh, that'd be cute. But like, I've also read their books and know that like, as much as I like their books, the way that we tell stories would not be cohesive, and like, yeah. that wouldn't work. I need someone who I feel like I could like vibe with, and like, yeah, yeah. Okay, that was. Um, that was so great, guys. This was a lovely shop talk. Um, I want to thank Emery and Johnny for joining me, for putting their feud partially aside for this entire <laughs> event. Um, I want to thank Christian, even though he's moved on from a story bookshop and is doing other great things. I want to thank him for being my point person for all of the past shop talks. I want to thank Lexi for being our tech person tonight and just a story of bookshop in general. You guys should buy your books from them because they're amazing. Um, I want to thank everyone who tuned in. Thank you so much for watching us. Um, if you would like to see previous shop talks featuring the award-winning best-selling authors, Kaysen Callender, Adib Karam, Leah Johnson, Abdi Nazemian, Elsie Rosen, Elsie Rosen, Arvin Amadi and Marco Shiro. You can find that on Astoria Bookshop's YouTube channel. Um, oh, do you guys want to plug your socials really quick? Yeah, um, I'm on Twitter at Emery Lee Who, and I'm on Instagram at Emery Lee Books. And I'm on Twitter at Johnny Escribe, like the word right in Spanish, um, and on Instagram at Johnny Instas. I'm on there's no H. Sorry, what? Oh, there's no H in Johnny. There's no <laughs> Johnny. Um, I'm on Instagram as Aaron Aceves, A A R O N A C E B E S, and then on Twitter as Aaron H Aceves, A A R O N H A C E V S. <laughs> um, thanks again, guys. This was this was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Bye all. Happy quarantine. <laughs>